July 15, 1976, Chowchilla, California, a day that the town would like to forget forever, yet remains a part of its history. At around 4 p.m., school bus driver Ed Ray was driving 26 students of Dairyland Elementary School home from a summer class trip to the Chowchilla Fairground swimming pool. Ray was described as a humble rancher with a humble day job. Stocky, about 55 years old, a guy you would not want to pick a fight with, a guy who works with his hands and doesn't talk much. On this particular day, Ed's bus was rowdy, but the kids all loved him for his patience and reliability. The kids were all loud and excited after just having spent the afternoon swimming. Some of them were even singing, but when the bus turns onto Avenue 21, Ray sees a white Dodge van blocking the road with its door open. He tries to weave around the empty van, when a guy in overalls with a pantyhose covering his face jumps out in front of the bus with a revolver. The man walks to the driver's side window and asks Ed, with no intimidation in his voice, would you open the door please? Ed opens it. Two more identically dressed figures jump in, one with a rifle which is quickly pointed at Ed. Everybody goes to the back of the bus. The one without a rifle starts to drive, and the one with the revolver hops in the van to follow them. They drive about a mile and park the bus in a bamboo thicket. The entire ride was apparently so silent that it added to the pure horror of it. The bus was hidden near the Chowchilla River, and 12 kids were ushered into the white van that was following the bus. Ray and the other 14 kids got into the back of the second van that was waiting at the location, this one green. There was a partition separating the driver's seat to the back of the van, and all the windows were sealed. Ed and all the kids sat in the backs of these vans for 11 whole hours, in the pitch black and extreme heats, all the while scared for their lives, not knowing what was going to happen next. Some of the older kids started to sing songs to try to lighten the incredibly horrible setting and make the younger kids feel better, songs like If You're Happy and You Know It. Meanwhile back in town, it only took 15 minutes after the bus not showing up that parents began to wonder what was going on. That's how punctual Ed always was. Within the hour, the missing bus was being talked about on the local news stations. Parents helped police by tracing the route the bus usually took, and by that evening, they found the abandoned bus. Within hours, 30 FBI agents arrived on the scene and an intense investigation was underway to find the kids and Ed. Late that night, the vans finally arrive at a rock quarry 100 miles away in Livermore, 3.30 in the morning, at which point Ed had been awake for 24 hours. The back doors of the van swing open and two guys are waiting. Ed is the first one out. He's handed a flashlight and then told to strip and then go down a hole with a ladder in it. Above ground, roll call is being taken for the children and their names are written as they're made to leave the bus one by one. Then they're stripped and sent to join Ed down the ladder into what was referred to as the hole, which turned out to be an old moving van, which had been placed in a large dugout hole 12 feet underground. Ed immediately worried that the ceiling would cave in or that they'd suffocate. However, there were two air shafts, hoses that ran above ground to a tree. There were also some mattresses on the ground and a pathetic amount of necessities. Wonder bread, peanut butter, potato chips, water jugs, and some holes carved for toilets. After all the kids were inside, one of the captors said, We'll be back for you. Then a steel plate slid over the entrance and was weighted down by something. They of course begged to be let out and many of the younger children screamed. Then they heard repeated thumps on top of the van. They couldn't see it, but their captors were shoveling dirt on top of the van, burying them alive. Panic ensued in the trailer when it was realized what was happening. Ed tried his best to keep everybody calm. Ed and Michael Marshall, the oldest kid in the group who was 14, started to push at the lid to try and open it, but it was pointless. So by now, Ed instructed everyone to eat and get some rest. Twelve hours later, the food was all already consumed, and the ventilation system that was keeping the van cool stopped working, and the hot July air started to fill the tight space. On top of that, the roof of the van started to cave in, and Ed knew time was very limited. The survivors, now adults, recount that around this time, as the walls and ceiling of the van were caving in and there was no food left, that they were starting to realize they wouldn't likely make it out of this alive. Ed and Michael started to pile up the mattresses in the trailer to get to the roof, which had been covered with a heavy sheet of metal and weighted down with two 100-pound industrial batteries. After hours of effort, Ray and Michael wedged the lid open with a piece of wood and moved the batteries. They then dug away the remainder of the debris block in the entrance. Sixteen hours after they had entered the van, the group emerged and walked to the quarry's guard shack, where a security guard called the police. Ed and the children were brought to a nearby jail where they were fed and interviewed by police. 
So the captors were three men, Frederick Newall Woods, James Schoenfeld, and his brother Richard. Frederick's family owned the quarry that the van was buried at. The three men were finding themselves in financial struggles, so they plan to hijack the bus and demand a $5 million ransom to release the group. The men would flee when they saw the group escaped though, but they were found after a two-week manhunt. They were found guilty and sentenced to life with the possibility of parole. Richard Schoenfeld was released in 2012, and James Schoenfeld was paroled on August 7, 2015. Frederick Woods was denied parole 15 times because he owned the quarry. However, in March of this year, he was granted parole as well. Rightfully so, people of Chowchilla and people around the world were sickened at the fact that the three men who committed this kind of monstrous act could ever roam the streets again. If Michael and Ed hadn't stepped up and dug the group out of that van, they likely would not have survived. Ed Ray died at 91 in May 17th of 2012, but he is still to this day remembered as a hero. What you just heard may perhaps be the most well-known near tragedy to happen to a school bus full of children. However, it's a big world, and there are unfortunately many other horrific events that don't end up on the news. Then 14-year-old Donald, who wished to have his last name left out, was a student at a high school in Virginia and a member of the school's band. The bus driver's name was Robert, but everyone called him Bob. Like Ed Ray, he also seemed to enjoy his job and enjoyed the company of the students he drove, albeit these students were a little older. On October 20th of 1995, Bob was driving a class of band students to and from their field trip. Donald was in this bus. The festival they went to ended late at night, around 10, and the drive back to the school where the students would be dropped off was a 45 minute drive away. The bus was on Route 58, a highway that runs through Virginia. Given the rural setting, there were basically no other cars on the road, but even when one car was relatively close to the back of the bus, it wasn't any cause for alarm at first. But when the car would start to tailgate the bus, instead of simply going around it, especially when the bus and the car were the only vehicles in sight, the students near the back of the bus started to realize and discuss amongst themselves how strange it was. Bob the bus driver would switch into the left lane to get the driver off his ass, and all the kids watched as the car floored it past the bus in the right lane, some kids shouting things out the windows, to which the chaperone on the bus told the kids to knock it off. Donald recalls thinking the car was gone and it was just some aggressive late night driver, when suddenly the bus slammed on the brakes so hard that everybody was slightly lifted from their seats and there was an ear piercing shriek from the brakes. The bus came to a halt on the middle of the highway and Bob told everyone to remain calm. The bus went into reverse for a few moments, then back in drive to another halt. Bob shouted at everybody on board the bus to keep quiet and don't panic. And hearing those words made Donald, along with his friends he was sitting with, and every other student on the bus whisper amongst themselves nervously. There was shouting from outside the bus from multiple men's voices. Then the bus doors opened, and two men wearing black pullover masks armed with handguns came on board yelling at everyone on the bus to shut up in response to a few students near the front screaming. One of the men with the guns announced to the entire bus to empty their wallets of all cash and take any jewelry off and to give it to them. They went row to row with their guns pointed at the kids, as each student took out their wallets and placed whatever small amounts of money broke high school students could be carrying in their wallets into the plastic bag the guy was holding, and the girls would take off their jewelry. Some students would scream as the gun was pointed in their faces, which would be a natural reaction for some. Donald described the moment he had a gun pointed at his head at 14 as emotionally traumatizing, that he felt his entire existence would end if he moved or looked at the guy the wrong way. The men didn't even make it to the back of the bus before they decided to leave in a hurry, most likely panicked that other cars would pass by and stop. The car floored it away down Route 58 with its lights off. Its license plates had been covered, indicating it was a planned attack, if the guns and masks weren't already indication enough. Everyone on board made it home okay, just most of the students, as well as Bob and the chaperone, had been robbed. Unfortunately, bus robberies are a common thing though, and while most probably aren't caught on video, what you're about to see was... A school bus traveling along the N4 in Whitbank one Friday night this past February was attacked by armed robbers. The teachers did not know it at the time, but the robbers had laid out rocks on the highway, intending to cause damage to vehicles so that the drivers would stop and the robbers could steal from them at gunpoint. The bus was carrying four teachers and the driver. There were no pupils in the vehicle. They were traveling back to the school after an athletics meeting when they hit the rocks and ruptured a tire. There were three robbers, 
two were armed with guns and one with a knife. The assailant stole cell phones, cash, jewelry, and a smartwatch. The bus driver was hit in the face with a gun and sustained a minor jaw injury, but that was the only injury. The robbers then fled the scene, and eventually a tow truck later pulled over to assist. One of the teachers borrowed the tow truck driver's phone and called her fiancé, who notified the authorities. Police soon arrived, and an investigation began. The robbers have still not been identified. Since buses can carry a lot of people, depending on the intent of the people looking to target them, they may see extra dollar signs just based on the amount of people on board alone. Even though you don't often hear about these things happening on the news, they do happen. In such situations where people are armed with guns, it's always best to just comply with their orders.